lagun eta dizkideok arratsaldeon pen hori eta gure ongi etorria Deusto Business Alunik eta Alfonso Libano Firestonek fundazioak antolatu dugun ekitaldi honetara. Gaur gurekin daukagu gure Universitate Deusto Business Schoolen MIT irakaslea Don Lezar Jauna. Mina eskerden hori gaur hemen gurekin egotarritik. Profesor Don Lezar, diputado de promoción económica de Vizcaya, decano de Deusto Business School, vicepresidente de la Fundación Alfonso Líbano Firestone, amigas y amigos, buenas tardes a todos. Os damos la bienvenida a este foro seminario que hemos organizado Deusto Business Alumni y la Fundación Alfonso Líbano Firestone. En esta centenaria universidad comercial de Deusto, hoy en día Deusto Business School. Vamos a tener la oportunidad de escuchar a una importante autoridad académica, al profesor de la MIT, Don Lesart, al que agradecemos hoy su presencia en nuestra universidad para hablarnos de clusters, economía industrial y globalización. Lo vamos a hacer, como veis, en un nuevo y más selecto formato de foro o seminario eh, al que asistís relevantes eh, personas eh, con responsabilidades importantes en el mundo empresarial de Bilbao y del País Vasco. Como tuvimos ocasión de comprobar el pasado lunes en el encuentro que celebramos con la consejera de Desarrollo Económico e Infraestructuras del Gobierno Vasco, Arancha Tapia, el País Vasco, fiel a su histórica tradición industrial, continúa en la actualidad haciendo una clara apuesta por su industria y su futuro, como palanca fundamental para el desarrollo económico de nuestro país. Sin más, cedo la palabra al vicepresidente de la Fundación, Alfonso Líbano Firestone, Gais Cauriarte, Ortuzar. Bueno, ahora se león y te un guietore de nore. Punto final, todo lo que se pasó. Bueno, first of all, I'd welcome to this first of a series of conferences organized by the Alfonso Líbano Foundation, Alfonso Líbano Firestone Foundation. First of all, I'd like to thank Guillermo Doronsoro, Dean of the Deusto Business School, allowing us to hold this event here. Agustín Garmendia, President of the Deusto Business Alumni, and Imanol Paradares, I think you are here, member of the provincial government responsible for economic development. And of course, thank Professor Don Donald Lezard for being with us here this evening. Not many people know that Fast and España one of the largest industrial companies in Biscaya was very much a local affair. As it was quoted on the Bilbao Stock Exchange, many individuals from the regions held shares in the company, including, by the way, my family, as my father was one of the founder members. Alfonso Libano, who unfortunately cannot be with us this evening, has been linked to Fireson as an important minority shareholder for many years. Globalization, as you know, is a reality. The Japanese majority shareholders of now Bridgeton Hispania decided not so long ago to make an offer for all the outstanding shares. Being an, <coughs> being an important minority shareholder, Alfonso Libano could have blocked the transaction. He wished, however, to remain linked to Firestone and suggested the creation of a foundation with Bridgeton named the Alfonso Libano Foundation. The aim being, on the one hand, that Bridgeton benefits by capitalizing on Alfonso Libano's successful business track record. You, know, you all know that he was the one responsible for bringing Coca-Cola here to Galdacano. On the other, si on, <coughs> on the other hand, uh, first, um, uh, Bridgeton is tied into its original industrial origins, which is very important here in Biscaya. Now, the foundation aims to be an institution representing the private sector and totally independent. This is very important. And it's aimed above all at the interests of Vizcaya, although we all know with globalization, geographic zones are often diluted and widened. 
It's not surprising that the most important immediate aim of the Foundation is to support and encourage any initiative related to the reindustrialization of Vizcaya. We all feel strongly about this, but Alfonso seems to have it in his DNA. As re reindustrialization is a very ample concept, we have to limit our objectives. We have started to, s to develop simple initiatives such as connecting people and institutions. Institutions such as those which you all represent here this evening. Meanwhile, we are drawing on our own experiences to clarify our objectives before our presentation to the general public. Our web page will shortly have detailed information on the Foundation available to all. One of our objectives is to organize conferences and seminars connected to reindustrialization, which will allow us to create a team in this field that will be an intellectual reference, but above all, a promoter that one day will be able to put together solid industrial projects. Thank you. Now, Guillermo de Ronsoro, Dean of the Dosto Business School, will introduce Professor Donald Lezard. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor. It's uh, really a pleasure to have you with us today, uh, Professor Lezard. Professor Lezard is uh, Emeritus Professor, uh, Epoch Foundation, uh, International Management uh, Professorship. Uh, he has, is one of the main experts in international business and specifically centered in my big projects. He is also a particularly expert in the areas of China and Latin America. He speaks very well Spanish, and although he seems younger than me, <laughs> he <laughs> ended the Bachelor of Stanford University at the same year that I was born, <laughs> which uh, I think we, I, I am going to ask him another conference on how you can <laughs> remain at that. He also uh, is MBA for the Stanford University and also doctor, PhD uh, for the Stanford University. He is a member of the relevant professional societies in the United States. He has an incredible trajectory of publishing and being member of the editorial boards of the main magazine, uh, scientific um, reviews in, in, in all the areas related to international management. He was Graham and Dodd Scroll for Best Article and Financial Analyst Journal elected fellow in the Academy of International Business, elected Dean of Fellows, Academy of International Business, BP Global Elix Award Partnership Category for Projects Academy. Uh, I, I would follow with all the prizes he has, but I think it's better that we listen to Professor Lesard. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. It's a honor for you. Okay. To come. Muy bien. <laughs> Yo diría Profesor Extinguido. <laughs> Ya estoy en MIT 43 años, estoy enseñando 47, no parece posible. Uh, tengo una presentación formal, pero iré bastante rápido por ello porque quiero una conversación. Y llegar a, a Bilbao a hablar de clusters, uh, no conocí el dicho y hoy lo aprendí, es traer arena al desierto. Hablar sobre ecosistemas aquí es traer arena al desierto. Uh, <laughs> pedí a mi colega Mercedes Delgado si ella sabía el dicho que en inglés es bring coal to Newcastle. Sí. Y ella no sabía el dicho en castellano, pero ya, ya lo tengo. Así que estoy trayendo arena al, al desierto. Pero lo que espero hacer es ligar lo que, lo que saben muy bien de clusters con lo que saben bien de ecosistemas en el contexto de globalización de empresas y cómo conectar los tres niveles. Así que es, esa parte es un poquito más nuevo, el, el otro es repetition. Uh, ¿puedo, ¿Puedo pararme? Porque yo no puedo enseñar sentado, no es, no es nuestra costumbre. Uh, nuestra costumbre es así, ¿verdad? Caminando, caminando. Okay. I'm probably, soy el único con grado en Latin American Studies que ha sido profesor de Systems Engineering. I'm not an engineer, but I, reached, I learned that stuff. From a business school viewpoint, soy más bien fundador arquitecto de programas. <coughs> Así que hice el BP Projects Academy, que es el, el modelo, modelo en la industria sobre project management. 
Um, the MIT Energy Miner, this is for undergraduates. It's across all five <coughs> schools. Science, technology, social science. Uh, that's the best thing I've ever done. Uh, the EMBA is our design. It's 22-day uh, weekends and five full weeks, a very different format with a lot of action learning. And that was my design six years ago, so I'm still teaching in that. I do all that stuff. And then I tell people when I'm not standing up, that's what I do. <laughs> the, the top one was halfway across the U.S. about six years ago, 4.5 days from California to Vermont. And it's Naprilia, right? 60-degree V-twin is a lot of fun. Okay. I usually don't do this at the start, but this is a synthetic presentation. Some of it is mine, most of it is drawn from my colleagues, and I try to acknowledge them where I do. So it's uh, Mercedes Delgado, who is just doing fantastic work on clusters, Fiona Murray, who's our innovation guru, uh, Joe Santos, who's at INSEAD, who is one of the best global strategy people in the world and a good friend of mine. Eleanor Westney, who's now retired from MIT, but who taught with me for 35 years. So these are the people that I've kind of built, built this on. Okay, what's changing? <coughs> you know these things, but it's worth repeating. The lead markets are dispersed and moving south. Right? The lead market was the US. It's not the US anymore. Uh, the distribution of knowledge is much broader. Costs are converging. The fourth point, I think, is the important one. I think that's the important one here. Many more firms and from different places that are capable of managing really complex cross-border undertakings. So I was out at AIC today and we visited CIE, which is a small, medium-sized enterprise in how many countries? Seven or eight countries in what, 15, 20 product categories? This is a small, vast-based company that is capable of managing complex technology and complex production across countries. Uh, I have student projects with Metals in Mexico and companies <coughs> like that, and 10 years ago, you didn't see that many. They were European, Japanese, or American that could orchestrate complex undertakings. Lots more. Okay, this is Pankaj Genwat's picture. You've probably seen it. Uh, this is sizing the markets by, this is the <coughs> number of mobile phone handsets in 2012, so it's a little bit dated. It's probably slipped further south. Because the Chinese market has grown more, the Indian market has grown more, the African market has grown more. But, uh, right. Ah, muy bien. Uh, este lugar pequeñito, Estados Unidos. Este lugar grandote, China. <laughs> Ahí están los mercados. <coughs> si, si es un producto donde los números están ligados a la población, no al, al ingreso, Es la figura. Ahí está el crecimiento. Um, costs are converging, es BCG, so it must be true. <laughs> Pero lo interesante aquí, US 100, Mexico, this is 2014. Mexico, which we've traditionally viewed as low cost, is 90. Spain is 120. Australia is off the chart at 140. A decade ago, these were two or three to one. We're at much, much tighter cost competition. And much of the internationalization is knowledge-based as opposed to cost-based. It's a very different world. Uh, supply chains, right? Uh, I always love to pull out my iPhone. I ask people, ¿Dónde está producido? Todo el mundo dice chino. ¿Cuál es el porcentaje de valor agregado chino? En el más nuevo, más o menos 10%. Mucho más coreano, japonés, alemán, y todos los márgenes son para Apple. 50% es IP y brand-based margin, right? Chinese. Así es el mundo. Uh, geographic patterns of science and technology. So top 10 countries, 80% of R&D. China plans to spend 2.5%. I learned today that uh, you guys are spending around three, which is outstanding. But if China is spending 2.5, it may not be that efficient yet, but it will get there. So that that's where the money is. Oh, the last point. Only eight of the top 20 firms in terms of US <coughs> patents were US in 2014. That means the other 12 were non-US in terms of US patents. 
So the landscape of innovation has changed radically. Uh, this is the breakdown, again, numbers. So we're still a third. That includes Canada and Mexico. Asia's 40%, Europe 20 some odd percent. Okay, that's all background. So what? The world is flat, right? No. <laughs> you and I know the world is not flat. It is very concentrated. It's spread out, but it's very concentrated in specific places. That's what clusters are all about. That's what ecosystems are all about. It's how do you manage the non-flatness. Production is distributed in clusters. You know this better than I do. Uh, motion pictures in LA, medical device in Minneapolis. I picked wines from, I hope, local. <laughs> uh, video games in Finland. I would have put video games in Korea. I have a new case that I did on Akamai, which is the leading company in internet content distribution. And Japan and Korea are the liveliest countries in terms of gaming. They are the lead users in that aspect of the internet. Uh, and there's a, there's a wonderful story in the case, which uh, Akamai spends about $3 billion for a US company that can take regular websites and make them into mobile websites. So they, they spend the $3 billion, and then they, they have to recover the money. So the head of this business unit calls the head of the Japanese subsidiary, and he says, uh, we would like you to commit to sell X hundred million of this product. And there's a long pause on the phone. And my, my student, who was the source of the case, was sitting next to the Japanese manager. The Japanese manager presses mute. And he turns to the American and says, God damn it. We had that product seven years ago, and it was better. If you had pay, paid any blank, blank, blank attention to us, you wouldn't have spent that much money. He unpresses mute. He will say, I will take no commitment. The company in Cambridge, founded by MIT mathematicians with the most advanced stuff, did not pay attention to the rest of the world, did not pay attention that some other places were more dynamic in some aspects of the business, didn't look for it. It's very common. Okay. Uh, this, how many of you have seen this latest work by Delgado Porter Stern? This is, this is their U.S. base, so they, they've identified 51 traded clusters in their connections. This is kind of the U.S. mapping. It's very nice, complete mapping. That's just background. Uh, what are your clusters? I was out at AIC today, so I guess there's an automotive cluster, right? What else? What are your clusters? Uh, you're aeronautics. Yeah, aeronautics, we've got that. Uh, paper. Pardon? Paper. Paper, paper. some paper. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of basis, it, it turns out, well, you know, but a lot of base in metal working of all kinds, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of going up from the core competencies of found, foundries. Fundición es básico aquí, ¿verdad? ¿Por cuántos siglos están haciendo fundiciones los vascos? ¿Diez, más o menos? ¿Lo conocen? ¿Es parte del DNA? Es lo, es lo básico en el conocimiento. ¿Altos hornos cuántos años tiene? ¿Doscientos, trescientos, doscientos? Bastante. Ok. Este es la mapa para el país vasco. Uh, this is all three provinces, so this is not two areas, so it's all three provinces together. Uh, dark colors mean that the representation of those industries stands out, right? It's stronger than the general distribution of those industries. Uh, so production, automotive, metalworking, pretty strong cluster there. A very interesting financial cluster, but around insurance largely, and then the traditional, if you like, fishing and water transport. Uh, so that's what the numbers say. This is based, this is not based on classifying a company as in the cluster. This is based at looking at buying and selling and interaction among companies. So this is forward and backward linkages in a com very complete input-output model. So on the basis of inputs and outputs, which clusters are actually working? Um, she can send this to you. It's it's really neat stuff. Uh, I have it. We have it for all of the all of the provinces of Spain. Have it for many other countries. Uh, it's I think the best empirical work 
on what clusters are. Oh, I think it matches more or less what you think. Right? It's, it's confirmed empirically. What makes a good cluster? You know these things, a related set of industries with linkages, input, output, especially the pool of, we're seeing increasingly, the, the shared skills, but also the pooling of the service companies. All of the specialty in, uh, engineering companies, testing companies, machinery companies, the service companies that serve, right? I think traditionally when we looked at clusters, we tended to look at the major producing companies. We tended not to look at the next tier, the service companies. Uh, Mercedes has a new paper that comes out looking at the service companies. They are a very important part of the cluster because it's the vertical linkages as well as the horizontal linkages in the industry that really drive it. Many cluster firms that compete and cooperate, large and small, and of course the support institutions, <coughs> finance, universities, etc. This is our story. ¿Cuántos han estado en MIT? Cuando yo, bueno, yo llegué a MIT antes de eso, pero eso fue el Kendall Square. It was the detergent center of the United States. The building that the Sloan School in was Lever House before Lever House moved to uh, Park Avenue in the 1960s, 1950s. So we were an old, rundown, deindustrialized area. And this pretty building right here, this was going to be NASA headquarters, and then Kennedy was shot, so NASA moved to Houston. So this became Department of Transportation. So we were an area with crappy industry, run down, a little bit of government involvement, not very much. <laughs> that's Boston, right? 1998, it looked quite different. Kendall Square now, that's 2015. You go to 2017, uh, basically it is the bio, biopharma cluster of the world. It is the DNA sequencing cluster of the world. It is the most expensive commercial real estate in the United States. Absolutely packed. Magic? Maybe, but a lot of the basic things happened. Uh, clusters and jobs, this is again out of the Delgado Porter Stern, that if the industry specialization, so again, the industries within stronger clusters are associated with higher job growth over this period, including the recession in the US. So if you're in a low industrial specialization, but high clustering in the region, you grow. If you're in low industrial specialization and low clustering, you grow. If you're in high uh, industrial specialization and no clustering. One dominant manufacturer, a couple big firms, you don't grow at all. And if you have a great cluster, but that is overly specialized, you don't grow either. There's a very interesting paper they have. That this is looking at the 2008 recession and which clusters came back. And the result is that you've got to have a cluster but the cluster has to have a small number of related industries. It should not be concentrated in just one industry. And it should basically have a pool of common suppliers. And when you think about it, it's, it's obvious. You should be diversifying across different demands. You should be using common inputs, common knowledge. A good cluster uses com common capabilities, com common skills, common suppliers, but it sells in the automotive market, it sells in the, I don't know, heavy industry market. It sells in markets that have different economic cycles and different developments. So usually you're told one of two things, right? If you're running a place, you should either specialize or you should diversify. And I was a finance guy, uh, so I would, would have told you you should diversify. <laughs> uh, the development economists would probably say you, they, some of them should say you diversify, some others would say you should specialize. This says you should be a diversified specialist, an oxymoron. <clears throat> Don't be in one thing. Be in a set of related things that draw on common underlying forces. I think it's a very important finding. It's based only on the US. It's based only at looking at what happened to the rebound of employment after the 2008 drop. But that was the finding there, and I think it makes sense. Uh, okay, back to, back to globalization. 
Uh, R and D, the world is not flat in terms of where R and D centers are. Uh, they're pretty concentrated. Uh, this one, right? Europe has not vanished. If you look at R and D centers, these are cross-border R and D centers. R and D centers that serve more than one country, not captive within a country. Europe is still a big concentration. We've got a lot on both coasts, right? This is Silicon Valley, but the whole coast, the East Coast is big. Europe's very big. India, pretty big. China, pretty big. Japan, of course, very large. Spread out. Uh, this is nothing to joke about, right? Argentina, Brazil. It's a substantial number of, it doesn't say anything about their size. It doesn't say anything about their, the size is, uh, I don't know whether it's, it's the num it's simply counting the number of R&D centers. So it's just counting. It's not saying how good they are, how large they are. This is just distribution. But that's, that's the map. Now we're in your world. This is a standard MIT picture of, so we've got, we've got a cluster. I think we all understand the cluster, but hopefully we, who's from orchestra here? Anybody? No, because that's bringing, bringing sand to the desert. Right? Arena al desierto. Porque es uno de los mejores grupos del mundo en el estudio de clusters. Pero it, I, I put the ecosystem kind of next tier up because we're really looking at the cluster that generates innovation, not the cluster that delivers production. And the cluster that generates innovation has the forward and backward linkages of the cluster that generates production, but it also has the risk capital, it also has the entrepreneurs, it also has the university, it also has the very active role of government, and very importantly, the corporate side, and I added the, these words to Fiona's slide, it has large local firms, it has locally based MNEs, Again, I was at uh, AIC today and I was impressed with how many of the medium-sized firms were multinationals. And it has foreign MEs. And the, the ecosystem, I think, and the evidence shows, works much better if you have the engagement and mixture of those types. So you've got to have the startup folk, which I gather you're still working on developing. You've got to have the money. Uh, they come to the money. Uh, but you also have to have the large corporations because they are the customers and they do an awful lot of the incubating of the talent. Where does the technical talent come from? Sometimes it jumps right out of the university, but very often it comes out of the large corporation. Uh, skip that. Startups founded by Global City. Is it, oh, whoops. This is missing the background map, but again, the world is not flat. The next slide is better on this. Um, this is venture capital by region. Mm -hmm. The world is not flat, right? So, five to one, Silicon Valley, right? Billions of dollars of venture capital. Uh, New England is a distant, distant second. Southern California is a close third. New York is a close fourth. All of UK <laughs> is a close fifth. <laughs> Beijing is a close sixth. All of Germany is a close seventh, <laughs> right? Israel, on the other hand, is right up there with Germany. So entrepreneurship, this is a, not a complete measure, but entrepreneurship measured by venture capital investment, which is not the same as entrepreneurship, because it's very much a US model. But entrepreneurship measured by VC is very concentrated. Uh, we knew this about ourselves. We felt like we were pretty good. Uh, we, we're in the number two innovation district. It's growing very rapidly. We've made much more of an effort to start doing academic research on why. Because if you don't understand the mechanisms, you can't improve it, you can't replicate it. You can say, we're wonderful, right? We're wonderful. Is it in the water? Is it in our DNA? Is it something we did? Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are some things we did, so this very specifically, and, and Deval Patrick had a lot to do with this, our previous governor, we had some very specific policies, especially around biotechnology, facilitating biotechnology. We had direct government, state level, not just federal level, state level support for that sector. Uh, some quite specific innovation ecosystem policies. Very specifically, uh, we had the uh, manager from the Boston Redevelopment 
agency in a program the other day with Chinese, and over, he said their, one of their key things was to make sure that we had nonstop flights to all the major cities. A decade ago, we did not. Now we have them to China, India, uh, as well as the European cities. And that's a huge difference in that. Um, Cambridge, the local government was involved. There was, a, there was a popular petition to limit biotechnology research. It was overturned. It required some fairly <laughs> massive public relations by MIT and the hospitals. And ultimately, the, the city came around and was very supportive, but with very specific controls and with very specific conditions on the contribution of the universities to primary, to elementary, and secondary education in science technology. I said, if you guys want to come here and fiddle with genetics in our backyard, uh, you better, A, be very careful about it, but B, you better make sure that you are contributing directly to this community. And so there was a lot of engagement right at that level. Um, Large corporations, uh, I don't know why they put these up, but we have all of the leading pharma companies in the world are in our cluster. They're all there. Novartis is there. Sanofi is there. Takeda, the Japanese, bought a large local company and they moved their global R&D center there. Lots of different companies have chosen that cluster as a major R&D center, big ones. <coughs> a lot of the infrastructure is paid for by them. Of course, they're raising the prices, they're pushing the entrepreneurs out, that's a problem. They do provide training and support the entrepreneurs. They're the investors. Uh, I was in a presentation the other day for one, one of these startup companies, it's about five or six years old. Uh, they have a technology that will completely replace biopsies as we know them for all forms of cancer. And it appears to work. So they can tell instantly, not a day later, what kind of cancer you have, what kinds of cancer you have, how rapidly it's growing, how extensive it is in which tissue. In a single poking of a needle, they can take hundreds of biopsies. Imagine what that's going to be when it becomes commercial. <laughs> uh, it's big enough, they said, we're not going to go to a VC and get another hundred million dollars. We're going to go directly to the strategic investor. And the strategic investors are the big corporations. So they, they've got to be there. They will have to be able to evaluate this. They will have to have their hands all over it. Um, I think it will be a billion dollar IPO fairly soon. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, universities, we think we're very important. Uh, we, we are very important in MIT. But you say it's MIT, but those of you who know Boston, we have a cluster of universities and medical schools. Very special. There's also something very special about our medical schools. So they're all Harvard related, but the two, the two hospitals were founded before Harvard University. So they were independently chartered. They have their own boards. They have their own endowments. They are also teaching hospitals for Harvard University. But there's enough of interdependence as opposed to dependence within the cluster that it makes it much more vibrant. So we have the best clinical in the country. We also have the best science in the country. San Francisco challenges us. Uh, University of California, San Francisco is outstanding. But the same things. I'll show you a bit later the things <coughs> we're doing on the MIT campus for nanotechnology, which is a new hot area. But this, this is just our success story, looking back at where it came from. Fantas this is Kendall Square, fantastic place. Okay, this, this is what I want to talk about. So, what are the implications of all of this for where, where firms choose to innovate? Multinational, are multinational firms going to choose to do some of their innovation here? Are locally based firms going to keep their innovation here or move some of it abroad or move all of it abroad? Right? It's a choice. If it's a very small firm, it has no choice. Once it's a bit globalized, there's a choice. And furthermore, the world is not flat. The world is concentrating. Large firms are concentrating where they do their innovation in a few places. Uh, footprint, right? So market knowledge, production knowledge, but especially technical knowledge. 
where are the leading centers of science and technology, the business models, etc. So the company will clearly go where it sells. It will clearly go where it's producing. But this, I think, is the new, the new foot. It's increasingly likely to go to some place that says that's special because of the knowledge, because of the business to do business model development in that location. It's not necessarily where we have a plant, right? Innovation 1.0 was, 1.0 we will innovate at home. 2.0 is we will move innovation out to some of the countries where we have a plant. 3.0 says we will pick and choose very carefully where we innovate. It won't be necessarily at home, we will pick and choose. Uh, okay, why is this? Here, here I go into my subject, which is really multinational management. This is a fairly typical org chart for a firm, front end, back end. Right? This happens to be Akamai, which is uh, the internet algorithms company. Uh, but notice, basically, the front end is sales and market support. It's market focused, and what I was talking to John Rice, who's the vice chairman of GE. And he said, you know, our front end, the job there is to localize. The front end of the firm wants to sell the products, and especially if you're selling grid products or aviation products or other sensitive products, you have to localize. Because you're selling to influential buyers, often the government. So the front end is all about being seen as part of the local scene. The back end, production and supply chain is optimized on cost, skills, and access to markets. A very different calculus. Of course, you might say, where's innovation, right? Where's innovation in this model? It's floating somewhere between the front end and the back end. Because it clearly has to connect the technology with the lead markets. It's not on the org chart. And the company has some discretion about where it puts it, right? It, it might all be at headquarters and might move around. Um, this is a thinly disguised example taken out of one of my student projects. So one of the things, the one thing I'm still teaching is what I call the Global Organizations Lab. This is for our executive MBAs. And these are five month projects for teams of five or six that have to be working on a company's problem. The problem has to be strategic. It has to have an organizational component and it has to involve at least two countries. And this, this is a, uh, First tier automotive supplier. This is one of our standard international management frameworks, Sumatra, who unfortunately died a few years back, but he was one of our grads, Chris Barton, who was Harvard. Um, how responsive or localized are you? How integrated are you? And the point here is that current product development, right? Developing and delivering the current product, engineering, production engineering is regional. The regional plant of the supplier, supplies the regional plant of the OEM and almost all of that cycle takes place within the region. Winning the next round of business, right, the, developing the next product has to be across regions a little bit because the OEM that you're selling to itself is global and you're competing among regions although the fulfillment is going to be done within the region. If you're going to be designing autonomous vehicles or advanced electronics or electric vehicles or something else, you really got to pull the whole global team together. You've got to be tapping into the best places. You have to be tapping into the best talent. Problem is, the company is down here because every day it's down there, right? Every day it's delivering, delivering, delivering. And it's very hard for it to reach out to think two generations ahead, especially when that requires a different geographic organizational structure than the everyday problem. So tough problem for companies, but that's also the problem that on the other side of the desk in attracting companies to your cluster. Uh, are they here just doing this? Or are they here doing this? Or can you attract some of them, right, in the advanced products? Can you be part of the system? Okay, this is patterns of innovation saying the same thing again. Is your innovation located at headquarters? Is it distributed? Is it one-way integration? Is it sequential? Is it simultaneous? Uh, when I teach this, I use the example of General Electric, uh, which is, of course is falling on the hard times. 
But General Electric was and is still an iconic U.S. technology company. It still owns the aviation business. It still owns the large turbines business. It's stuck in some sectors that aren't growing very quickly right now, but that's a different problem. Uh, and GE, right, it, GE set up one of the first industrial research labs over 100 years ago. This is Thomas Edison's company. But every time they bought, they made a foreign acquisition, they shut down the research lab. Because they kept their innovation at home. Their first foreign research lab was in India in the year 2000. 100 years later, 100 years old. Right? So innovation is up in Schenectady, New York, at the upper end of the Hudson River, and it's pushed out to the world. Now, the traditional pattern of the multinational is, whoops, it will adapt and innovate for local application. A lot of work, but kind of a dead end because it only is for local. A really good ones, I don't know why this is not showing up, will adapt and innovate for local, but they'll bring it back. I've got an article on this, which is actually in the Harvard Devstow Business Review on rats and cats. So do you have capabilities that travel? Are they relevant, appropriate, transferable? Can you find things out there that you can bring back into your DNA? Or are they complementary, appropriate, transferable? Uh, that's right. Most companies are either stuck here or are in this kind of simultaneous model. But what we're seeing increasingly is expand innovation core to multiple bases, the so-called meta-national. So for my advanced vehicles, I'm going to have three or four places linked. I'm not going to have 20 places. So I had a team last year with one of the Japanese auto manufacturers uh, who happens to have a Euro European partner, so I guess that gives them away. And they also, <coughs> they also had a center in Silicon Valley. So it's basically Tokyo, Silicon Valley, and Paris. And that's where the action is going to be. Uh, and good luck if you're going to get some of it here, given that they can only manage the three, right? Uh, other firms will pick different <coughs> configurations. Or you're seeing this one, it says draw on world for core innovation. The example I like to use is um, Xiaomi, the number two company in China and on uh, smartphones. Totally Chinese, built in China, basically for China, but the founding executive team collectively had 120 years experience in Motorola, Intel, uh, Nokia, etc. So the guys that got together basically brought the industry to their place, which is, think of it, very, it's very different than the firm growing up at home, learning how to do things, throwing them over the wall of other places, probably adapting them there, maybe bringing them back. That world all gets collapsed and increasingly will get collapsed into a global, into a global innovation system. Not a very good map. You can help me with it. This is the first time I put it up. Well, I'm trying to get at the notion of a heat map. I'm saying, how, how hot is your region for a company? And I'm trying to get more than two dimensions on here. So the top is, right, how big is your market, but also how dynamic is your market? Is it a lead market? Is it an interesting market? Is it small and not dynamic, or is it small and dynamic? Is it large? Is it large and dynamic? Right? Where, where are you there? And then. What, what's the local capability, which I've classified as passive or active or passive or active? Passive, they do some production engineering. They, do, they solve the local problems, but they basically follow orders from headquarters. Right? The specs are provided by headquarters. The processes are provided by spe spectators. They're blue on a heat map. They're passive. Uh, and so if, if you're in a small, not very dynamic market, and you've got locally focused passive engineering, obviously you're going to be pretty blue on the heat map in terms of innovation. You're not going to contribute anything. Uh, if that small market is dynamic, still probably not much because you're stuck in a passive role. If you're locally focused or active, if your market is dynamic, right, you'll generate local innovations. Will they matter? Will they get supported? Will they get resourced? Probably not, right? You may have a very interesting company, but if it's not integrated internally, who cares? Uh, once you get up here, though, right? There you go. So 
to me, I think the message is, so this, this is the Basque country, right? You're small, you're relatively dynamic. Uh, you can't change your market very quickly. In fact, you can't change your market because it has a certain number of people. You can change a bit the geographic boundaries of the market. What can you work on? You can work on the role that the units within the companies here play and help them become active and help them become more integrated. So you could be, you could be quite warm. You're probably not going to be red hot, right? This is, this is engineering in China. Uh, another one of these student projects, we were looking at engineering development in a company that makes yellow tractors. And we were comparing Peoria and Wuxi and Chennai. Uh, and it's very interesting, the, the engineers in Peoria, they all go to Purdue, uh, and the, they're, they're really formed organically. They just grow up, they grow up building hot rods, and they go to high school in Indiana, and then they go to Purdue, and then they go to work for CAT. Right? And, and everybody knows everybody else. The knowledge management systems are quite informal. Uh, the engineers in Wuxi, they get all kinds of resources from headquarters because they are in a hot market. And headquarters brings them all the latest stuff, and they get to work on and modify the latest stuff because they are in the hot market. The poor guys in Chennai are running, are, are running lab tests overnight. They don't even know what's going on at home. Right? That's, so they're, they're special. They're actually better trained, better engineers than either China or the US, but they're not integrated into the system. Because they're not a big market. You kind of get the picture, right? So, and I think, I think there's some knobs on that locally. Right? How do you, so you're working not just on getting the corporation to be here, but you're, make, you're trying to encourage the engagement of the local engineering and innovation activities within the corporation, at least on a regional basis, probably on a global basis. Otherwise, you're just moving chips. <coughs> okay. Uh, this is just a picture on who's got the, the patents on autonomous vehicles and, uh, you know, Google over here. That was for this afternoon. Okay. That's kind of the picture so far. Um, what I was trying to get at with the globalization point is that globalization is as much an organizational issue within the firms as it is about a place. And if a particular location is going to become warm or red hot, the firms in that location have to be internally wired so you need to work as much on helping your people orchestrate their integration within the firm as making them technically competent. Especially, especially if you have a small dynamic market. If you have a large dynamic market, it's going to happen. The world will come to you, right? The world is not good. Uh, I tell my students that I study the G20 minus the G7. When I say, what does that mean? I, like, I really like to study middle countries. The G7 countries will be on the world economic map regardless of how well they manage things. Right? The U.S. is going to, even with President Trump, we will be on the world economic <laughs> map for a long time. Even with Prime Minister Abe, the Japanese will be around for a long time. The Chinese are certainly there. The Indians are certainly there. Uh, European Union, even without the U.K., uh, will be there, right? So us major established players will be there. We'll be fighting for our shares, but we're going to be there. Um, and interesting question, what do you do about individual European countries like Spain? You would say it's a middle country. What do you do about a Brazil? What do you do about a Mexico? What do you do about a Korea? What do you do about a Malaysia? They don't necessarily have a position in the technological world. They have to fight for their position. In a tech, they're not going to get it because of size, because of market importance. And I think you can reflect that down to Spain or down to the province. Europe is going to have a position. Will a province have a position? You have to fight for it, right? It's not going to be pulled by the market. The market doesn't hurt you. It's a pretty good market. Although, actually, you're well beyond the market, at least in the auto sector, you're not selling primarily the local OEMs. You're selling 
regionally and globally to OEMs that are elsewhere. So you've evolved past that, right? So it's not pulled by the market. It has to be pulled by other conditions. So the cluster rule, and, and the reason why I like the uh, Delgado, Porter, Stern so, stuff so much is it's really good empirics. You've got to build on what you've got. So the first thing is you've got to recognize what you have. And you want to water the grass that is already growing as opposed to trying to plant new grass. If it's not growing, there's probably a reason. If some of it's growing, right, you can see if you can improve it. The ecosystem, I tend to say, focus on strengthening the weak links. And I think our conversation just before the evening said the government is trying to re strengthen the weak links in terms of individual entrepreneurs who are financed by outside capital, right, which is not a traditional best model. You've got the corporates, you've got the universities, you've got government support, but it's, I think it's a family control place where the freewheeling entrepreneurship and the outside money needs, right, a little nurturing. And of course, your ecosystem doesn't have to look like ours. It will have its character of its own. But that would say those may be weak links. Um, on the other hand, if we went back to that ecosystem model, I personally think your mix of small and medium-sized local enterprises, locally based firms that have become multinational, and foreign multinationals that are here is very important. So I think that mix is kind of the right soup of the corporate context. Now, so it's not, it's not that you need to attract necessarily a new corporation here. It's that you need to make sure that some of the work it is having somebody doing on some element of advanced vehicles is being done here. Right? It's making sure that the activity gets done here. It doesn't necessarily mean building <coughs> a big auto plant or or the air, you're not going to get an aircraft factory, you're going to build components. Okay. Um, global connectivity, which is my focus, uh, I think connectivity in and out is crucial. So logistics, and I'm told it's pretty good, head of the port, right? Better be good. Uh, it looks like you are in a very nice location. Uh, you're certainly in a nice European location. I frankly think you're in a fantastic position given Brexit. You're the closest continental land, really, other than France. And France is, you know, pretty hard to deal with. <laughs> other than France to the UK. And the UK is going to have to deal in some ways with the EU as a foreign country. That may change some things for you. Um, it's cost and frequency. I do a lot of work in Latin America. And Latin America's problem has been frequency. It just doesn't have enough frequency of shipping to be credible in many industries. Um, the legal and fiscal barriers and Brexit is exactly that. The digital integration. Uh, is, is anybody, how, how deep are the, is the industry of uh, data farms and server farms in the Basque country? I look at your lovely hillsides here and I assume that there should be some lightning fast uh, fiber connecting you and the city of London is this should be the place where transactions that have and data that has to be stored within the EU is done with the minimum latency vis-a-vis -vis London. Virginia Beach, we have a number of new connections. You do? Where? Where? Yeah. where? Virginia Beach in the United States. Oh yes, yes. And you have them to here. But you need them with the UK. So if you if you look at New York City, the Meadowlands behind New York City in the New Jersey side, all of the data centers for Wall Street are there. Because the distance matters in microseconds or micro microseconds in terms of latency. Uh, if, if London trading has to be backed up and fiscally managed within the EU, I think you're closer. And that distance matters, right? So consider some fiber optics and can, right, the government should be seeing if it can get Google or whoever else does the data backup for London to set up here. It's an opportunity created by the change in the barriers, right? You're in the right place. <laughs> um, attractiveness to foreigners, uh, Boston, we think Boston is a lovely city. Boston was not very attractive. It was attractive to European executives. It was not attractive to Asian executives. 
It did not have enough Chinese language schools. It did not have enough Japanese language schools. You have to have bilingual schools in Chinese and Japanese and Korean if you're going to attract people from those growth markets. Because the people you want to bring are in their 30s. They're going to be building their careers. They're going to be building their families, right? So those are things that have to happen. Um, and I think very importantly, we had this conversation at the AIC today, the increased supply of locally based boundary crossers, people who are a multilingual, have worked in multiple places. It sounds like you're doing a pretty good job on sending people out. If I see a gap from what I heard early today, you're not cycling very many foreigners through here. This is not the place where the young Indians or Chinese or Koreans or, or even Poles come to learn the business. You go in there to teach them. <laughs> if you're really going to be a center, they're going to come through here. And you have to think about what it is that attracts them for six weeks, six months, two years, three years. How do you make them welcome? Right. And how do you, how do you make sure there's a little more balance of trade of people, not just Basques leaving, but <laughs> other people coming. Now, maybe, maybe this is happening. Legal, of course, IP, business trans contract, promotion, promotion, promotion. Uh, so at MIT, we've had a very long string of Singaporeans. So I've, I've been talking to the Singaporeans since uh, 1973. Uh, Singapore got cut loose when 65. The British, it was a British naval base, right, threw it away, nothing. Uh, and it was early, set, late 60s, getting the early 70s, when they started actively promoting themselves as an industrial location. They had no capabilities, they had no entrepreneurship, they simply had place and low cost wages. They went out and purposely picked the companies they would attract through the Economic Development Board. When the Yen shock happened, 1973, uh, you're all too young, but in 1973, President Nixon cut the dollar loose from gold. And the European currencies and the Yen rose relative to the dollar. The Yen rose by 40%. And the Japanese were just getting into their major export boom, <coughs> and suddenly their costs went up by 40%. Singapore was on the doorstep of the Japanese companies the next day. It knew which companies were in the right position, and they were there saying, we have turnkey factories for you. Come to Singapore. So you should be saying, we know what you're going to have to do to get ready for Brexit. <laughs> we have it here. I'm, I'm serious. So it's not just advertising. It's actually knowing which firms you want, getting inside their minds, knowing what they're looking for, and what are you trying to sell. You're not trying to sell establishment. You're trying to sell engagement in the engineering and innovation process. So that's bottom line. So this is my final slide, and hopefully we can have a few minutes of conversation. This I borrowed, like all of these slides, this is from Mercedes Delgado, but she had ecosystem presence and ecosystem effort. And her point is, if you had ecosystem presence, no presence but effort, you didn't get anything. If you had uh, ecosystem presence and, and effort, you really got some good stuff. I'm adding this column. You can have ecosystem presence and ecosystem effort if you really haven't worked on the global connectivity you get a little bit. You really have to do all three plays in order to make the cluster work. In the modern world, a cluster is not worth much if it's not globally connected. And it's not going to do anything for you in innovation unless it's globally connected. That's, that's kind of my bottom line. So any, any questions, tomatoes, <laughs> potatoes, what have you? Es, es sintético porque estoy tratando de combinar tres literaturas distintos. Para verlo en el cluster, ecosystem, globalization. And think of globalization, not just the map, but the decision and organizational map of the companies that are on the other side of the table. No, no. What should be the statistics we should be looking at, uh, monitoring, to Ooh. understand how things are moving? If we are moving better in this kind okay. of so thing. Because you need to, to, to monitor. And you need to monitor, and this probably requires some surveys and asking as opposed to just statistics. But what I, So let, let's take the automotive industry. I would like 
a catalog of what the initiatives are that each company is involved in, and it's typically involved in two or three, it's not involved in 50. What are the major initiatives of the company? Are they partnered within the cluster? Mm -hmm. Are they connected globally? So who are you with, how? And if you had, you could go out to the automotive uh, yeah. center, AIC, and you could do that with the members. You could actually take the sample, you could map the initiatives, you could get a sense of how many of them, you or have the map of this. how many of them are between small companies and big companies, how many of them are between vast companies and foreign companies? How many of them actually involve communication with engineering or innovation centers other in other locations? You could do that. That would be a, a wonderful study. Well, then, well, Chris, then you would start then you start knowing how your machine is working. Then you then you know better how to turn the knobs. So I think we're we're past just saying let's attract firms into the cluster. Necessary but not sufficient. Let's build beyond the cluster into an innovation system. Necessary but not sufficient. Let's make sure that that cluster and that ecosystem are globally connected. Now it's running. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Yeah. Dentro de esto que llamas ecosistema. Sí. Tenemos tenemos centros tecnológicos. Sí. Tenemos Um, empresas, universidades, universidades sí. tenemos empresas sí. eh, grandes, pequeñas, medianas, sí. eh, tenemos políticos, sí. tenemos sindicatos. ¿Quién tiene que liderar? ¿Quién debería de ser el líder normal de un movimiento que vaya hacia las recomendaciones que nos han hecho? ¿Quién? Oh. That's, that's, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I think it has to be somewhat distributed leadership, but distributed leadership never works unless there's some unit that is willing to step forward. Uh, it sounds like you, you both have a competent government and you have some confidence in the government. So maybe in some cases the government can be a bit forward, although, again, I've only seen one of these clusters in depth. I was out at the automotive cluster today. That is an industry-based group with government support, and they are collectively managing this, right? They have collective governance of this because they have a 15-year-old institution. And that's probably where it really should rest. So you're trying to kickstart that in aviation. Five or six years from now, it will have collective governance. In the meantime, Maybe you have to carry it along. Maybe the university is going to play a key role. Maybe, maybe there are one or two entrepreneurs. So at MIT, um, Bob Langer uh, is basically the guru of targeted medical delivery. So it's all kinds of different ways to deliver medication to the body. Uh, and <coughs> hundreds, if not thousands of patents, almost all the students involved in 50 or 60 companies. He just starts companies like this. He 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 has he smells blood. He can he can see a piece of scientific research and he says there's IP and a market there, and he turns it into a company. <clears throat> and he doesn't publish it in the best scientific journals. He publishes in the most in Journal of New England Medical Society, the most widely read journals. He knows how to push the machine to get the ideas out. So you sometimes there will be individuals who grow up, who have big stature. They may be entrepreneurs, they may be university professors. In our case, they're both, right? Because the, the ideal MIT professor is a Nobel laureate and uh, has made several hundred million dollars from a startup. That's our God. Our God is academic and has done it. In Singapore, who did the promotion? Bueno, el gobierno en, en Singapur empezó totalmente por el gobierno y, y hay que entrar dentro del gobierno. Entras ahí, hay un controlling group entre los singaporeans. What you'll find out is that the young men, men, increasingly women, are selected at the secondary school level. They are taken through the universities. They all become officers in our artillery. They all serve a rotation in being the representative of the Singaporean military in a nearby country, because Singapore has no space for military exercises. 
So if you're going to fly planes or bomb things or run naval ships, you do it in Australia or New Zealand or Korea or Malaysia. And so every one of these people goes through two years as an artillery officer, goes through two years running Singapore's re military relationships with another country. And at that point, they are selected into the inner circle and some of them join the Economic Development Board. It's too tight, it's too close, it's, and they've been trying to open it up. But it's, and Philip Yeo was an individual, he really pushed this. He, he saw the need to promote Singapore, he knew how to market in a Western way, uh, he knew how to pick companies. Uh, they actually, they copied the Taiwanese, the Taiwanese started. The Taiwanese were in the same position but the Taiwanese had very close political ties with the United States. As you'll recall, Madam Chiang Kai-shek came to the U.S. and we had the famous China lobby for many years, so it was very deep in U.S. politics. And Phillips and Texas Instruments were both picked by Taiwan as the leading electronics manufacturing companies and were asked to come and set up there. They are the beginning of the Taiwanese electronics industry. It was an active move by Taiwanese government officials to pick and invite specific companies. EDB does that. EDB, they, they now have a local industry upgrading program. So they give multinationals that are based <coughs> in Singapore is mainly run by multinationals. There are relatively few Singaporean companies. There are relatively few entrepreneurial companies. That was one of their weaknesses. They give a substantial tax credit uh, to companies to spend on developing local suppliers, local industry upgrading, and they put a Singaporean in to manage that within the company. So I give you a 2% on sales tax credit for building up local suppliers, and I lend you somebody to run the program. Is that person government or is that person company? <laughs> really ambiguous. They're part of the civil service, but they're embedded in the company. That's their job. And subsequently, they've been doing that on entrepreneurs. They're saying, let's find Asian entrepreneurs who have good ideas, who want to meet the money, and we will bring them to Singapore, and we will set them up with the money. So I hear you're trying to bring entrepreneurs here, but you've got to go there with the possibility of a bag of money. And it's not investment banking money. It's angel money. It's VC money. It's early money. Right? It's early money that we would throw at you to allow you to be independent, not be dependent, and then start getting integrated with the system. So that, it'll be different each place because you're working with a different suite of attractors. But what are your attractors? What are the firms that are here anyway? What are they doing here anyway? How do you upgrade that to more innovation? How do you upgrade that to more internationally <coughs> integrated innovation? How do you facilitate that? And it's, it's just like the logistics, but how do you get the people moving, right? Really easily. Short-term entry, medium-term entry, long-term entry, uh, schools for the kids of those foreigners. You want to see a pack of Poles and Mexicans and Brazilians and Chinese and Koreans coming into your wonderful technical vocational schools, right? Not just bass going to those and then taking the technology elsewhere. Um, yeah. Excuse me. Can you speak? In this region that you call small. Yes, but remember that Boston has 600,000. The Boston metropolitan area is a million too. So we're at the same scale. Yeah. I mean, Boston, Massachusetts, and the bass country are about the same. And what I learned, we have. Really, within our continents, within our continents, we have, we have similar positioning. Uh, you have a much higher educational level than the average of Spain and even the EU. We have the highest educational level in the U.S., 41% college graduates, et cetera, et cetera. So we specialize in highly educated, highly trained human capital. And, of course, we have attractors. We have what? At latest count, I think it's 150 colleges and universities in the Boston area. Uh, in the academic year, we have 300,000 university level students in the Boston area. Now, obviously, in, in a city of one point, in a metropolitan area of 1.2 million, the 300,000 don't all come from local. They come from everywhere. Some proportion of them stay. 
And our entrepreneurial community is very strongly made up of people who came to MIT or Harvard or BU and did their PhD, got in the labs, or did their masters, got in the labs, and stayed. Right. So I'd say half of our entrepreneurial supply are foreigners who we attracted through the educational system who decided to stay because it was a sweet place to grow up. If you're born in Boston as an entrepreneur, you either stay in Boston or you go to Silicon Valley. About 40% go to Silicon Valley, we keep about 60%. But we keep them from any other location. So the kid comes from, Cleveland's not a good example because Cleveland's really good in medical devices. But pick, I don't know, uh, Kansas City or some other place in the middle of the United States, or Michigan, or Indiana. You come to MIT, uh, there's probably a 30% chance you'll stay. That, right, so the university is not just to train your people, but it's to be a magnet for a select group of people in your region. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've worn you out. It's late. I'm tired. No. Uh, there's, there's some, I think there's, there's good scientific evidence behind much of this. Some of this obviously is just belief. Uh, the, the cluster level is, I think, very scientifically established. The ecosystem level, we're really seriously trying to research it now, but I don't think we have scientific proof, we have belief. The globalization, very little, there's, there's very little good statistical work on globalization anyway, and virtually none that gets inside of companies. I can measure the footprint of a company, I can measure what it produces where, and how many people it employs. I can even measure how much it spends in R&D. I can't measure from the outside the linkages around initiatives. It's really hard, mm -hmm. really hard. So to some extent, the most important questions are still a bit on faith, right? They're on logic and faith, and it seems to work this way. But you, you could. You could do scientific studies on a number of clusters. You could see which ones perform relatively well in these dimensions, not so well on these dimensions, what it seems to take, right? Because the sample is small enough and it's close enough to follow. You can ask one by one. One by one. It's actually some wonderful student projects to do the asking. Seriously. Uh, you, could have, you could have the scientific knowledge. Um, it could be... It could be uh, Cluster slash ecosystem 5.0, I guess. <laughs> okay. Thank you.